Welcome back to Arise Africa and now the rest of the program. Here is, a, is cherry news. Lagos has been projected to be a 21st century commercial hub city in Africa and the world. And as part of efforts to get it um, to that pedestal, a 32,000 metric tons per hour rice mill is under construction in the Imota area of the state and scheduled to reach completion by 2020. When completed, it's anticipated to hugely contribute to economic prosperity of the state. Nigerians are therefore anticipating not less than 250,000 job opportunities from the staple food project alone. And to tell us more about the project and the opportunities that it holds is the special advisor to the Lagos State Governor on Agriculture, Abisola Ulusonya. Good to have you on the program. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so um, before we actually talk about the rice mill project, I want us to talk about agriculture generally. You know, um, let's start with an overall assessment of your outlook on the agricultural field uh, here in Nigeria and then in Lagos in particular. So thank you for having me once again. Um, in terms of my overview on what I see as agriculture in Nigeria, I think the government is making great strides in ensuring that agricultural productivity in the nation as a whole rises. In terms of GDP contribution, you see agriculture contributing to real GDP of Nigeria as of 2018 to about, of about 25%. And that is actually a very good thing. And if you look at non-oil exports, agriculture actually contributes to about 75% of that. So it's actually a very critical comp component of ensuring economic prosperity for Nigeria. We cannot keep depending on oil. And if agriculture is contributing that much, it means that there's so much at stake in ensuring that food security, in ensuring that our farmers are well funded, in ensuring that we put the right infrastructure in place for us to actually grow the sector to becoming a main economic, um, um, should I say, e um, economic consolidation of uh, prosperity and also of ensuring that Nigeria as a nation moves forward in the agri-space globally. Mm -hmm. And based on some of the things that you said, because uh, earlier on, one of the statistics you gave is that 75% yes. that it contributes to the GDP, which is quite good. 25%. Uh, sorry, 25. Actually. Okay, yes. yes. Sorry, my, my, my error there. Thank you yes. very much for clarifying that. Yes. So, uh, which is not that high. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. So, what would you see are the challenges that has been okay. facing in this sector? I think the challenges would be, one, access to funding. It's actually very difficult because the agricultural sector by the banks is seen generally to be a black hole. A black hole in the sense that you don't have more data to go by. And when you don't have that much data to actually do the proper analysis of the sector to see what the risks are, to see what the benefits would be, rates of return and all of that, it becomes very difficult for you to actually give funding as a bank to farmers. Also, you don't have good collaterals from those farmers to hold on to as a bank. So it makes some of these things very difficult for the farmers to be able to, you know, increase their productivity. So access to funding would be one. Also, in terms of the infrastructure available for farmers as a whole, it's actually not too um, economically uh, viable. Economically viable in the sense that in Nigeria, we know most of us have to provide our power. Mm -hmm. You have to provide your water. And these are part of the cost uh, factors that increase production cost in Nigeria. So cost as a factors whole, and cost implications. Yes, and cost implications. So when you compare like to like what you produce in Nigeria versus what you produce maybe in Europe, mm -hmm. the cost of production here would actually almost double or triple, which would make it not as viable for anyone coming into the space to see it as, you know, a place to uh, um, you know, invest. invest in exactly. Mm -hmm. So it makes so these would be two critical challenges. Aside that, you also have shifting government policies. One administration will come in and say, you know what, we are going to impose this kind of import tariff. Mm -hmm. Another administration will come and say, we want to ban some of these things completely. Then another administration will come and say, yes, we want border closure. So that inconsistency in government policy doesn't also give the confidence for investors to come in to say, you know what, these are the risks that I'm going to face and this will be the rate of return. So when these things are not put in place properly, then it doesn't make it um, an investment climate to bring your money into. So these mm -hmm. are some of the challenges being faced in the agricultural space. Which begs me to ask this question, yes. you know, if the government, you know, uh, if, like you say, it, with, with regards to the government, the example that you gave, yes. that sometimes with the change in government, you yes. know, they're changing policies and yes. stuff, what can the everyday person, yes. you know, 
do to sort of uh, encourage this sector? I think what the everyday person can do, if you'd ask me, I think a lot of us, at least for those that maybe have houses with gardens, mm -hmm. you can start planting in your backyard. I mean, you go abroad, you see people with uh, backyard gardens, you see mm -hmm. them vegetable trying to live... Vegetable patches. Exactly, vegetable patches. You see them trying to live a healthier life. Lifestyle. And that also, in terms of, it increases the amount of organic products out there. So I think people can get into that, number one. Number two, it's for us generally as a people to start embracing agriculture. We should stop making agriculture look about whole and cutlass uh, kind of uh, perception. It's more Agriculture up to has now. gone beyond <laughs> that. I mean, if you go to countries like Singapore, where mm -hmm. the landmass is so small, which I would invariably compare to Lagos, there's so much being done in the technology space with regards to agriculture. You have hydroponics, you have uh, vertical farming systems, you mm -hmm. have so many things that are done. Even, I read an article where um, I think some under bridges in Singapore, if I'm correct, where they have fish tanks to utilize the little spaces that have available, the pockets. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that people can, you know, bring to for and start investing in. So I think everyday people, we can start looking at alternatives to rather expecting our foods to come from certain areas, geographic areas. We can start trying to make sure that, yes, we produce our own foods in our own homes, in our localities as well. All right, then. Thank you very much. Let's now talk about, you know, the rice mill project, which a lot of viewers would definitely like to hear about. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that, because um, the project is likely to create uh, or is expected to create as much as 250,000 uh, yes. jobs. Yes. So tell us a little bit more about that. OK, so the rice mill, um, I can start with the history. It was uh, created as part of the Rice for Job program of the Lagos State as far back as 2009. Subsequently, a 2.5 metric ton per hour rice mill was actually set up at Itoy King, and uh, that was uh, dismantled once we decided that we we're going to do a 32 metric ton per hour mill. So I needed to correct you because in the beginning at the introduction, you had said 32,000 metric ton per hour. No, so it's 32 metric ton per hour rice mill. Now, this rice mill is expected to create over 250,000 jobs. Now, viewers might you know, start to infer that, do we really need 250,000 jobs? Like, how possible is that? But what we are trying to say is across the entire rice value chain, that amount of jobs would definitely be created. And when you look at the rice value chain, what do you have? You have the um, input and cultivation aspect, which is where you have the farming, which is where you have the research institutes coming in as well to probably help us in terms of the kind of rice varieties to be grown. You have research, so you have the research institute, you have irrigation technicians, you have the farmers. So that alone constitutes a considerable number of people to be employed in that space. When you look at the uh, processing, aspect in the value chain. The processing is where you ha have quite a lot of people processing in the sense that even before you get to that particular um, uh, level of the chain, you have paddy aggregators who would get us the paddy and that also you have a lot of people in that space. In the processing itself, the processing of the rice, once you get your paddy, then you have your drying, your steaming actually, because this is going to be parboiled rice. You have your steaming, you have your drying, you have your milling, you have your sortexing, you have your polishing as well to be able to get you the parboiled rice, which will be, you know, invariably the brokens will be between 5% and 25%. So like I said, in that space alone, apart from having the paddy aggregators, you have a lot of people that are going to be in that milling line to ensure that, yes, you have a, num a good number of jobs. Then when you move to the marketing and consumption, which is now going to you know, be a larger percentage of the population of the jobs that will be created. This is where you have the marketers, this is where you have logistics providers, this is where you have storage providers. So 250,000 jobs, it might sound huge, but yes, this rice value chain, this meal is actually going to ensure that, yes, we have that number of people. Okay. So 250,000 jobs, that is what the government of uh, Governor Babajide Olushola, so Wudu's administration is actually promising with this rice meal. Okay, now we've heard about, you know, the rice meal for quite some, some time, time now. So, yes. and um, when is it likely to be completed? Is there a date? Is there a deadline? Yes, so we actually have a deadline. So this meal, it started um, from the last administration, and I think that was as far back as 2017. Work ramped up considerably, 2018 more or less. And then since the inception of this administration, May 29, the government of Mr. Governor, 
Babaji de Olushola Sowolu had promised that no project from the last administration will be left undone. So we are ensuring that there is continuity because taxpayers' monies have been spent on such projects and we cannot afford to abandon them. Mm -hmm. So already for this year alone, we've had several meetings with contractors on site, with mm -hmm. uh, mechanical installers, we've had meetings with our uh, Let me jump in works. there. Sorry yes. to jump in at yes, this point no in problem. time. It's just that we have a limited a amount of time. Yes, okay. so I want to get yes. that information. Yes. When yes. Will Okay, so the mill is actually going to be completed in 2020. We want it to be completed latest by second half of this year. When I say second half of this year, so we're estimating that somewhere in the third quarter of the year, the mm -hmm. mill would be ready. So we've only got a few, few yeah, days left. Few, no, so I said third quarter, quarter of 2020. No, you said this year. That's why no, I was no, like, no, no, okay, no, no. So unless you want to correct yourself. No, okay, I'll correct myself. Thank so you. Third because, quarter of 2020. because I was listening avidly. I was like, did you say this year no, no, or next no, no, year? No, no, no. So third, third quarter, quarter of 2020. 2020. Yes, the well, mill you, would be ready. Yes, you know, the, 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 um, what I wanted to raise as well is the fact that um, the last time that yes. they wanted it to have been, the deadline to have been February 2019. Yes. So what the guarantee that this is not going to be pushed forward when it comes to the third quarter of okay, 2020. So I would say that for the shift in date from February 2019, obviously we know that as at that time there was going to be a change in administration. So some of these things became bottlenecks to ensuring the mill was completed. Mm -hmm. There was also some funding gap. Okay. And then let's even assume that February 2020, we, uh, 2019, we couldn't meet the date and we should have met the date sometime this year. If you also look at the change in weather patterns, the amount of rainfall this year, it's actually part of what stalled the completion as well. But we are assuring you that under this administration of uh, Governor Babaji de Olushola mm -hmm. the mill would be completed and delivered to the people of Lagos in 2020, third well, quarter. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> All right, before I go, let me ask you one other thing. Okay. Now, projects like this usually end up apparently in the hands of foreigners yes. who allegedly uh, make it worthwhile or who don't make it worthwhile uh, okay. for the local artisans. Okay. You know, is that story going to repeat itself in this uh, project of this magnitude? So I think what we should rather look at is not whether it's in the hands of foreigners or not. We should actually look at do we want an economically viable project? Do we want a sustainable project? Do we want a project that gives back to the people of Lagos? I think these are the parameters we should use to judge how the mill is going run and not look at the nationality. Now, I cannot guarantee where that would go, but what we have in place is we want people, local people to be trained in running this mill. We want, there should be like a graduate training program mm -hmm. as well, where we have rice right, and everything integrated. Yes, thank so you so much. I'm afraid you. that's where we're going to have to leave it. We're out of time, unfortunately, but quite interesting talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for